Wow! I feel the goo. I know that I will know. I feel the goo. I knew that I would now. So, so much, much goo. goo. So, so much goo. goo. I, I got, got a you. you. Yo, 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 what's good, everybody? Yeah. Uh, we're finally here. Good cast going? number eight with Pat himself. What's good, Pat? How are you? How's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. What's My going, man's uh, all dapped up. <laughs> so he's looking so yeah. professional right now. I was like, bro, where, where? I'm like, where Where do you live, bro? You got the nice <laughs> view in the back? Like, God damn. <laughs> but, um, got the small studio, but it's in a cool location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, we got a lot to talk about today um yeah. if and if you guys are, are listening in from you know youtube spotify or apple Podcasts, don't forget to follow us on our socials as well as uh pat any shouts you want to give before we get started uh shout out to rocky mountain collectibles nice let's go best team okay okay and then uh, i'll put their information oh, in the description box so, okay so pat yeah. um what's up I i'm curious how what convinced you to come back to this game I mean, I just missed it. I had been, you know, working at home from way before the pandemic. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just missed. You don't travel very much. People have a reason to. Uh, and, you know, I missed the competitive aspect of it. Yeah. When, if you think about, like, because you, you've been playing the game for a while, right? Like, how long have you been playing? Uh, since Metal Rangers. Wow. Okay. So, w w when you think about, like, yeah. when you think about, like, you know, you and your what people call your prime, right? Like the, the, the 2013, 14, 15 era. And you think about Yu-Gi-Oh! now because you've been playing again. Do you notice a difference in technical play um, compared to back then and now? Like, do you, do you think, like, well, like what's the difference? Or, or like, is there no difference? Is it like, like the, the same thing still matter, you know? I think ultimately technical play is still like a 10% advantage where deck building is still like the bigger advantage to be had. And okay. so if your strategy is to, you know, top as many events as you can, which I think is a good strategy, right? Uh, then, you know, technical play and just focusing on that can really take you further. But I think the still the way to win tournaments is, is through having a deck building advantage. Well, that's, yeah, I think honestly, when I think about like the decks that have been winning, all their deck building advantage has been Mystic Mine <laughs> and Rivalry. <laughs> <You manage. laughs> so, like, let's talk about Mine for a little one. bit. Um, yeah, sure. Bro, we, we, I mean, we, we were chatting about this, like, before the call started, but, like, why do you think they didn't ban Mystic Mine? Like, is it our maxi, essentially, or, or what, like, card design-wise? What are your thoughts? Um, so, I, I am in favor of it getting banned, but I understand, I think, why Konami might not have banned it. Um... You know, it really is the thing that gives any deck a chance to win. You know, we've got Access Sisters, we've got the Plant deck, a bunch of different decks. You know, Swordful winning months after it came out instead of getting conquered. Uh, you got a lot of different examples of, of decks that weren't necessarily part of the meta or in their middle still winning. And I think Konami acknowledges that that is because of Mystic Mode. And so while we look at it as, you know, we can't play, uh, I think they look at it as it gives everybody a chance to win. And I think, like, fundamentally, that's something they want. And yeah. I think, you know, long term, it probably still will. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that's probably why they kept it around for now. No, what'd you say? Sir? Oh, I wanted to know if he kept an eye on this current format and what do you think will win Utrecht? Like... Yeah, so... I am in a weird place where I know very little about the meta for that because I'm still going to Ecuador, which is like post ban list before that set. And then uh, I'm staying in Ecuador until Minneapolis because it's like four days. So like, what am I flying home for? Uh, and in that four days, I, I intend to learn it <laughs> as much as I can, but I've been focused more on Ecuador right now. I, I only have like a very simple knowledge about the next time. Okay. But what were you going to say? Something you, you were, you were going to talk about like um, Mystic Mind or something? Or that you were going on a tangent? You want to finish the thought? Uh, I was just going to say, I think it would be interesting if everybody played three Mystic Mind. Like it wouldn't be the same dynamic it, it is now where both players 
you know, sit there for as many turns until they kill you uh, that we see now, because then everybody would be forced to play the outs, which, you know, people are starting to play a good amount of outs to it. Whereas, you know, a couple of months ago, there was just very few outs to it in anybody's deck. Um, but you still see it being like a really above average card. Like it still does more than, you know, any other card in the game could in a lot of situations. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, we see like, uh, cards like mine where it, it comes in and out of formats. Cause it's been around since like 2019, right? Since dark Neil storm came out. Um, so we see it come in and out of formats and it's like, every time you're under, uh, like, you're not prepared, it slips out of nowhere and just like gets you. It's like crazy how that card works. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my opinion, Konami could have kept Mystic Mine in check by banning Curious. Because the way people are approaching against the spell decks are by sending the virus or by sending spell canceler to reborn it with the Dugares. By keeping Mystic Mine in check, what do I mean? I mean that now, like for example, without the threat of virus or without the threat of spell canceler, we could have more decks mis mixed with Runic. What do you think about Runic as an engine? I think it's a really good engine for sure. Like there are very few cards in the game that have applications when they do first and second. Uh, and so the fact that every single card in the deck has both of those uh, inherently makes them good cards. I think the battle phase dynamic is really interesting because you see Konami create like more, I think, strategic restrictions around cards mm -hmm. where like Sprite can't make access to it, Runic has to skip your battle phase. And so I think they're being very thoughtful with the kinds of restrictions they put on cards. Um, but I am a bit concerned about having to go second with no battle phase mm. into a board uh, it, while mixing it with another deck. But I do think it's, I, I think they're very good cards. I, that's my main concern. Okay. I mean, I, I... As you said, it's a strategic thing, okay? Because you can still enter in the battle phase, use Drunic cards in order to special summon the dog from the extra deck and then attack a crash and then pop one card. I mean, as you said, it's a strategic decision. Like, you have to build your deck in order to be able to activate uh, actively, proactively cards during the battle phase in order to out your opponent board. Um, what do you think about Sprite? What do you think about the tier elements? How do you think the meta will evolve? And do you actually think that Cherries is a good card right now? I'm sorry. Very, a, a lot the of questions. Cherries is a good card. No worries. No worries. So, uh, Cherries, yes, I think it's a good card. But it's always a little bit of a weird card because when you play it, they can just do something else. And while you do hit something good, now you're down a card. They're still making whatever, whatever they made probably gives them another card. So now you're probably down two cards. And so I do think it's a very impactful card. Uh, but I think that, like, those reasons are probably why it always seems very good and then ends up seeing some play. And it's not, like, a staple a lot of the time. Um, Sprite, I think they get a lot better after the after the new set. You know, there's not much mm -hmm. distinction from what they yeah. were doing, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, right now, like for Ecuador, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I, I don't know if I think it's more than a splashable engine, like as a standalone deck, it seems like really weak compared to a deck like here. Um, and I think tier is coming in as like the clear best deck right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's so interesting that they kind of hit basically everything else except tier. I mean, the big tier hit was like snow. But I remember, like, when we were in Brazil, you were, you and I were at breakfast, and you are like, bro, do I even put snow in my deck? <laughs> and I thought about that. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Like, you're actually <laughs> contemplating not putting snow in your deck. So, like, for you, you're probably like, man, this balance don't matter. <laughs> you convinced me to put it back in. <laughs> I did. I did. I was like, yo, you have to put that card in. I will say this is the first ban list. Yep. This is the first ban list I've ever played where I was playing every single card that got banned, though. <laughs> yeah, dude, I thought, yo... Yeah, Chaos Ruler. Oh my god, yeah, you're right. There's so many cards yeah, you got banned. Like, all five. I, I feel Konami is a meta behind on the ban list. Like <laughs> Chaos Ruler, Alki Fibrex were very impactful, the previous meta. Now that were less impactful, they were just okay with the punk stuff, they decided to ban those. Like, it's so weird, the approach no, that Konami I, is taking. Yeah. Hmm. I, uh, I don't know. I think that before how got banned, it was like very good in the deck when I was playing, like last format with where it was tier mixed with yeah. sprite because then it was like 
you stop Zayam and it turns into Plague, which turns into Gigantic, which is like, you know, everything you needed. Um, and so I think it was just an above average card. I think that lack unfair things that were being done with it were, were really scythe. Um, yeah. I really liked Hulk. I wish I wish they didn't ban it. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was one of my favorite cards, but I understand why they did. Um, and I do think that we probably missed out because there were uh, on the, the like Visa Starfrost with uh, the tier cards and yeah. the tier claws, I the, that the how plays there were actually insane, and I think it, it was it was too little too late and it got banned. But yeah, um, I I do think that that was like something that was truly unfair. Yeah. Okay, talking about Scarecrow, like did you did you follow the Triff channel? He was saying that the Scarecrow engine was yeah, he was lasting. hyping it up a lot. Yeah, he was like plus six. It's just yeah, plus six, plus <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I cannot see the plus six. <laughs> Would you like to alight us if you know about the plus six? Because I don't know what the plus six means. So before, uh, yeah, so before uh, how got banned, if you have like a visas on the field by itself, you could go yeah. into the Scareclaw, it goes and gets the field spell, you play the field yeah. spell, you get the uh, warrior one that specials itself in search of the reborn. You search the reborn. You make a link to there, uh, and then you play the reborn on visas, and then you can get back the link one once per duel if you control the visas. Yeah. Yep. And then you could go into how fair, and so it it turns into a lot of cards for sure. Like yeah. that, I remember there's like a way to make curious off of it. There's there's a lot that you can do with just Visa Starfrost on on the field before how it got banned. Yeah. Um it's not bad now. It's still like Appalooza, like on yep. the field by itself. So it, it's certainly not bad, but it was definitely crazy before how it's got also banned. Baron plus a link one. And if you have and, and if you are already yeah, yeah, into an alpha you... play, then maybe you can curious. I mean I mean, it's Baron Elf, actually. It's Baron Elf. Like, he plays around Imperium Nib. Because, like, because that same play you talked about, you make a generic Link 2, and then and then you make you bring back the Baron, bring back the Starfrost, then you can make Elf on top. And then, like, if you didn't have to Link off the 4 um, to make the Link 2, then that's a Baron right there. It's free. Like, it's so disgusting. Um, but it also made Chaos Ruler yeah. 2 before, right? Because, like, cause if you pop a tier, you just make Garua, yeah. and then you make 5 or summon, like, Plague, and that's a, that's a Chaos Ruler Baron. Like it's so free, um, yeah. So maybe yeah, Jeff was right. A, maybe it was a plus six. We just didn't see it. <laughs> I, I think it was actually crazy. I, I think it was just um, too late. Yeah. But I think it was actually. Bro, oh my god, oh my god. Okay, dude, you, you, yo, you said it. Okay, so for YCS and the Agra, if Triff showed me his deck the night before the YCS, if I got all the cards in time, I would have played that deck a hundred percent. That bro, the stuff he was doing was disgusting. Yeah, no, I think he was right. I yeah. think he was right. I think he was right. <laughs> no, shout out to Trish. Shout so out do to you Trish. think? <laughs> shout out to Trish. Mm -hmm. So he was playing the Water Enchantress. He was playing the Ride of Aramajor and stuff. Do you think Wandering Griffon is correct in such lists, uh, or would you play just the Illegal Knight to shuffle it back? So you because because you can mill the Wandering Griffon. When if you mill the Illegal Knight, then you can sh just shuffle it back, right? So do you think it's justified the presence of a card like Wandering Griffon in a deck like that? Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Um, the adventure cards are, are kind of weird because they're really good mills, but it's like, you know, six good cards for like... Three bad ones. Two, <laughs> two three bads. Yeah. yeah, three bad ones, really. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, it's a weird ratio. Um, I think that's the first problem with it. Uh, I've never thought about not playing the Griffin and just playing it because you could shuffle it back. It yeah. does seem like it makes sense i guess the biggest problem there would be that you're scared of nib and so like yeah. if you have like some other way to play around nib there then it, it seems like it makes sense you know what's crazy that's actually how he lost to jesse he he so he lost to jesse in brazil because he i think he added a legal instead of griffin and he got nipped for his life savings <laughs> which is crazy <laughs> um but yeah. like nib's a really interesting card yeah uh i think the best thing about it in the tier mirror is maybe as well I think. Yeah, I mean, what, what it, should be banned. But. Card design wise, how how do you feel about Nib? Like, Maybe. do you think like it's like what what are your thoughts on Nib as a card, just from a card design perspective in general? Do you think it's fair? Do you think it's I, balanced? I think, uh, I, yeah, I do actually because mm. um, so like when you Nibiru 
you have to do it when they're threatening a negate. And the thing is, is like most decks aren't just making one negate. And so I think by definition, a lot of the time your turn wasn't over when they have to activate Nibiru. Uh, and so I think that balances it a good amount. And but it, it is, you know, a really crazy card. Um, and with like much fewer sprites in the format, I think it, it'll probably be played mm -hmm. for Blue Track and Ecuador. And and uh, I think we'll, we'll make a reference to uh, a Farfa podcast, right? I think you were on Farfa stream uh, uh, before for one of his subathon. Um, I watched the whole thing. It was really sick. If you guys haven't checked that already, I'll, I'll leave it in the description. I'll leave a link in the description box below as well. But uh, Pat, I remember you talking about how you wanted to ban Appalooza. Do you do you still believe Appalooza should be banned, or what are your thoughts regarding like? uh ban lists overall like car design because i think that's a very interesting topic yeah sure um appalooza i i definitely don't have a strong of opinion as i used to on it um i think it's on the edge of like a card that should be banned because mm -hmm. in a lot of ways it is a plug gate like you you often have to like draw non-engine cards i think in the now i think there's like more ways that you can just chain block it and things like that that like when I, I that was when I first started getting back into the game. Maybe yep. I was just missing it, <laughs> to mm -hmm. be honest. Yeah, uh, that's like a totally real possibility. Um, but mean, to me, you need a couple like a couple laws after so yeah. many. Sh Sorry, continue. No, you're good. You're good. I was just saying that. Okay. No, like you read like the card like a couple laws after so many years when you come back in the game and you have to think right. the card yeah. is like the card is wrong yeah. because <laughs> because the power creep increased and increased the like so. It's I, I think it's odd. I think the, the thing that's interesting is I think when you made that point regarding like Apple is being bad, I actually did agree with it. Because I think at that moment in, in, in uh, uh Yu-Gi-Oh's history, Apple's was actually insane. It was actually made so often, like most it felt insane. Yeah. It, it made it was made so often and so early. But I think as the cards got more and more insane, I think that's when you were like Apple's is like an okay card. That's how crazy Yu-Gi-Oh has gotten. Does that make sense? I think cards like, are getting very good. And, and, and like I think the, the the point that I'm trying to make or maybe even delve into a little bit more is that like if if Yu-Gi-Oh gets more and more power creep like after every set, right? Like what what is like you know at what point does everything just becomes like way too broken, right? And like you know, uh, I think the most limiting factor uh, now that the cards are getting like very very good and you know presumably will continue to get better because that's how it's always been is the extra deck still being 15 and you know i don't know that konami is likely to change that because i think logistically uh it would make the games take a lot longer and from a like tournament organizing perspective i think that's a difficult choice for them to make and so right now i think sort of like having tier cards that we keep recycling and keep re recurring. I think the the extra deck is probably the most limiting factor, and I think that's actually one of the things that makes tier stand out the most mm -hmm. is that they can recur extra cards, yeah. and that's not something other decks can really do. Yeah, bro, I was playing a uh, Lunalite tier limit uh, ever since the ban list, and bro, I, I could easily fit in twenty five extra cards. No, no, mm -hmm. no joke. Like, like Bujin Kazuchishi yeah, is not 100%. once per turn. It just mills five cards, not once per turn. I was like, bro, what? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like like there like there's so many cards I wish you could play like the Reptile King X Y Z, um that card is cool like but the thing is like you're there's so, so limited cards. like yeah like the fifteen the fifteen extra X slot actually stops like so many disgusting things in my opinion but I uh, I want why do you want to talk about the Luna Light bro Ma Master of Six you. Master of Six imagine that would be crazy the twenty extra pack, cards pack, I hate you. why Pat Patrick Pack forced me to test day and night the Luna Light combo. <laughs> Okay, in order to tell it, like, in order to figure out the entire game plan of the deck, and then he comes to the fucking Y, says, and he doesn't play the deck. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, bro. I was sick. I was genuinely sick. I was like, we do this, we do this, we do this. One card combo becomes curious, <laughs> up or lose, a full combo. And he goes, yo, that's sick, Nash. I'm going to play it. Then he comes there, he calls me, and he says, no, Nash, I'm sorry, brother. Like, three to me on a new route. And it was, Dude, the punk cards like, are too oh. broken. Teleport is too broken. I had to play Chaos Driller one last time before it got banned. Okay. I had an issue with that deck. Okay, let's, let's discuss about it. I'm actually curious about the... Um, let's do it. Uh, the, your thoughts, Patrick. Okay, here is my issue with the punk stuff. I tested it at the start. Like, I was 
a very big fan of the... Uh, I don't know if you were following my stream, but I was mixing punks with the elements at the start a lot. There were, an issue, about, yeah. there were an issue about that. My issue about that was that the extra deck was very specific for the punk stuff. It's not like you can use the tier elements in order to go for the part of the extra deck that's uh, that's uh, applied to the punk stuff. Like you cannot naturally go into a chaos ruler without going for a Garura or a special summon the level to Shinobi with the Alki Fiber without the punk stuff, okay? Like you have to commit several plays in order to access that part of the extra deck. With with the with the Luna Light stuff instead, you are playing rank force. And rank force are very easy accessible from your entire tier element engine. So my thoughts are, was that worthy to commit for slot of your extra deck just for the punks to resolve when if you mill, I don't know, a Dirnov or resolving your, uh, your stuff or you have to start with the tier elements, then your entire combos becomes way dif more difficult to resolve. Does it make sense to you? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. No, if the re if the question is partially why didn't I play the Luna Lights, is because I didn't I didn't really have any concept of it. I didn't know very much about it, uh, so it wasn't really like an option, I guess, in my in my head. Um, and the punk stuff, you know, I debated on it a lot, and I tried it with and without. I think it fundamentally plays a little bit differently like for example i don't play curious i, I didn't play curious um, and i know curious is a really good card um but one of the main reasons that i didn't play curious was that uh you know i think it's best with the dangers for sure and the dangers conflicted with starter and that's the starter was just a fundamentally better card and part of the concept of the deck is that i just wanted to play more teleports in my deck than my opponent was playing Yes, and then because the, the, the dangers also conflict point. with the punk. Because how do you start? Right. Do you start with exactly. the teleport or do you start with the danger? Teleport. When your opponent already Yeah, you have, right. to start with teleport, yeah. <clears throat> you have to start with the teleport. In terms That's of milling easy. them, yeah, in terms of milling them, I wasn't as worried about uh, milling them because if I had them in my hand, I was just going to play them first. Um, and I think there are a lot of advantages around playing the sprite card too. And and I was playing swap frogs as well. So like, you know, I had a bunch of different stuff. And so like if the uh Zay Almond gets stopped, it's really easy to turn it into Hulk at that point, get plague, get Gannick, and then you know, you can keep going from there. Yeah. And so one, I had more teleport. I would just play the whatever punk cards I had first. And you know, the power of chaos really is it, it's basically an auto win. Like as soon as Chaos Ruler actually resolves, it, it it was very unlikely that you were gonna lose the game at some point. Yeah. I mean I agree on that. Like yeah. I, I totally I can totally see your point. I tested also the swap frog. Uh, my issue with the swap frog was the fact that you cannot end with uh, Todd and Dweller. And <coughs> I always wanted to make a dweller in like every time I want to make a dweller because yeah. I'm very scared of like, because uh, b before in the sprite, like against the sprite, they had the toad in the graveyard, like they had the, um, the, the frog in the graveyard, I don't remember the name, um, to, to banish special summon itself. Ronin. Then they had Ronin, thank you, Ronin Toadin. Like they had Ronin Toadin in the graveyard. Against the tier elements, you already know, like Dweller is FTK. So uh, blind most of the time, um, I would like to go for a Dweller line because not every uh, tier element list plays over 41 like if, if your opponent is playing 41 it can be sprite it can be tier element can be everything okay but i mean before a match starts you'll obviously ask if your opponent is on 45 then you have to make duel my issue with the swap was i cannot make totally a well so with dweller or the okay. white i get super one thing life. about that i would not ask i would not ask if i lost the dice roll because then they're gonna ask me back yeah and makes sense. I mean, yeah. Uh, if I, I would only ask if I won the match. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. Yeah, I I agree with that actually. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. On dweller, <laughs> on dweller, uh, you wouldn't want to. Um, I don't know. Like, I obviously you want to make dweller every first turn, right? But if you in this in that deck, you could make it probably a little bit under half the time. Like, it was definitely less often. Um, but the boards that it would end on, like a normal end board 
if you like resolve the punk would be like Baron, some uh some tier, Solik, Smashers, Toad, else. And it's just like that is kind of enough. Yeah. You know, Game and enemies, so yeah. I, I wasn't yeah, I wasn't I wasn't as worried about it because I, I realized even the games that like I couldn't get to the dweller when I was going first, like if I just mm-hmm. did what my deck was doing, that it didn't matter that much. Yep. Um but I can still get to it like enough of the time to justify playing it. Yeah. I let's let's uh or mud dragon. Mud dragon's yeah. the easiest way too. Yeah, I yeah, it's so because um I do think the swap I actually like swap with with uh sprite cards in, in tier, but it, I think the point about dweller makes sense. I it's just like but I think what's really broken is the fact that if you get hand trap infinite times and you cannot make like dweller, like and you make a gigantic, that's two negates because of elf. It's actually so dumb. Like that was so dumb. Because like you just get like a toad with elf after getting hand trap infinite times. Which I thought was like when 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 because I was trying out yep. the the swap as well in like the tier and like the the tier as well as like you know the sprite cards and I was like bro that's actually so dumb you get hand drop infinite make a freaking toad elf and your opponent just can't beat that with three cards or two car- or four cards it's so hard, um so also there yeah, is a it was thing very resilient that, mm-hmm. yeah th- there is a thing that in the tier element mirror a lot of people do not understand how broken Mod Dragon? is Mod Dragon or yeah. the Swamp in the mirror. Like, that card is good. the best card for the mirror. Like, if I yeah. can fuse in my opponent too, after your opponent commits a normal summon in the tier element mirror, and this is very important, and he goes for a ticket chaos, and you are able with an Ophenis to go into a dragon, he's stuck. Yeah. He needs extenders in order to play. If he doesn't have an extender, he has to pass on the spot. Yeah. Like, let's <clears throat> let's say your opponent activate normal summon Reinhardt, activate the effect, and you chain off Ennis, and you mill whichever dark, a danger, uh, and with with another tier element, and you make Mod Dragon. How does your opponent continue from there? Yeah, he, he can't. cannot. Yeah, because, like, you can't kit target cannot. itself under mud. Um, yeah, then, yeah like... Like, you call dark with the mud right after, yeah. and kit cannot target itself because you call it dark. Yeah. Like, a Mod Dragon is extremely broken, especially also going second, yeah, going because second. Yeah. it should be the first fusion that you summon in right. the mirror, because every interaction in the tier elements mirror targets. That's that's another thing, and that's also why I really love the opinion, the Lunalight engine, because they, they are not only dark... But they like a two card combo is very insane. But there is a question that I want to ask you, Patrick. Um, did you test the new Crystal yeah. Beast engine with the new trap? No, but I do think it's really cool. Uh, I think the the foolish barrel goods really makes it viable, and you know, milling it any field spell. I think it seems really solid. I'd be really concerned about playing those going second. Uh, like the the crystal beast specific cards, um, but outside of that, I mean, it seems like it was a good one. Mm. Like there are there are so many options that you can do with that. Like you can add the village, for example, post side, and you can end on dark, so your opponent cannot that's activate cool. any spells. Like that's <laughs> yeah. Imagine my imagine we still have snow, then you don't need to like you don't need to make dark. You summon snow back, uh, GG. <laughs> I mean, you don't like. <clears throat> here is the thing: like, we needed something else to special to send with the curious. Like now, you have in the Luna Light deck, you have so many options. In my opinion, like you can send Counselor, you can send the Trap of the Crystal Beast. Like there are, in my opinion, you you can send the Perfume. Like in other decks, you cannot utilize the curious as you can, in my opinion, in Luna Light. And also, Counselor is inherently better than the Virus because the Virus is good going first. My issue is going second. If I'm playing against a Mystic Mind deck with Floodgates, going second, with Virus, I'm losing 100%, no matter what I have. Uh-huh. When if I have a Counselor, if my opponent doesn't draw Judgment, I win on the spot. I guess so, only against the Mind yeah. decks, not, not like the actual Trap decks. Right. No, only yeah. against the Mind decks. Yeah. Against the Trap decks, I've had a great different. experience with Eradicator. Like, I, I yeah. tried it a couple of different times, and it's never worked out very well for me. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, like, I, I think yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's it's not a guaranteed line as in the like because Luna Light has a guaranteed line to get into Counselor when you kind of have to freestyle in the tier element pure with the Sprite engine or with the, like uh, the, the 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 Punk engine in order to get into the Epidemic Virus. It's kind of nah, 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 nah. stop, stop, stop. One teleport ends on that shit. What are you saying? 
teleport by itself ends on like like it, it literally is eradicated by itself. No cap. I mean teleport. Uh, okay. Do we <laughs> want to talk about teleport alone? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if we want to talk about teleport alone, teleport alone was playing around <coughs> Diddy Crow. Because instead of elf on top, you just make a dark on top. And if you're opponent Diddy Crows, you are ba basically playing around the Diddy Crow by making curious with that. Because in, uh, because usually you go I mean, uh, I, we, Alki Fiber special summon yeah. the level two, and then you go instead of elf on top. If you make dark, you play around Diddy Crow. Yeah. So yeah, by yeah. so if you're opponent Diddy Crow, you can just use Dark to reborn his Diddy Crow, and then you go into the curious line. And that's yeah. that's a line of a play that I really liked and I very enjoyed back in the was testing the punk stuff. Yeah. Um, as I said, my issue was I could not mix them with dangers, and I really loved to use the dangers before to break my opponent sprite board. Yeah. So that was kind of an issue. There is a card right now that, in my opinion, is gonna be insane. Okay, now this the this the goo the goo of the day, the tech of the day. What is it, bro? The, I mean, if you wanna talk about the goo of the day, the tech of the of the day, I think it's evil. What do you think about evilly, Patrick? Evilly match? Evenly? Yeah. Mm. Every time evenly gets played, and this is both my experience playing with it and having played it against it, it always looks very good and it banishes a lot of cards. But then the person who activates it, I'm not sure they end up winning the game as often as you would think for as good as it looks when they activate it. Um you know when i don't know i i feel like that's been the case a little bit with it like i got even lead one time recently i managed everything except so like and i had hopness in hand and then it was still just like multiple traps he has no battle phase now uh or very similar thing when it was despia being you know played everywhere where you could just you know chain branded in red and then summon a fusion keep that and then add up another chain now you still have two traps and so i feel like things like that keep popping up and I think that holds it off from being crazy, but I think it's still above average. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it it's no other card that's going to banish the field face yeah. down, right? But it's just I, I've been surprised. I've been surprised, like the amount of games that get locked after activating a really good even. I think what what do you determine? What what makes a card above average for you? Like or like for you, like when you determine card quality, right? Like what what like determines that for you? Like how do you make that analysis? Um, I feel like I've got a lot of filters in terms of those. Uh, like I, I feel like I can tell if a card's good or bad pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, give me, give me some examples, sure. and I'll tell you. If, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I um, like I, because I think it's interesting, right? Because you just started playing the game again. You, you got back into it. There's a huge learning curve, so you have to like learn a lot of these cards, in my opinion, quite quickly. Um, so that means you're like in this time period that you got back in the game you evaluated a bunch of cards and you determine how good they were so i guess like uh an example i can give is like starter like uh like uh you know sprite starter um so yeah so sprite starter i think uh i've seen like even the decks that play you know both tier and sprite they aren't playing starter often uh and i've been playing three of it even though it's primarily a tier deck and really the reason is because you know, it's been three traps ever since it's come out. And, you know, you can activate it almost as like a fusion destiny where, you know, if you oh. didn't stop me, then I'm going to play it and put up three traps at the end of the, at the end. And yeah. if you did stop me, well, you know, that was probably the best thing I could have had anyway. And so I think it ends up being a really good card. Um, and, you know, you could just choose when you play it. It's like going back to That's dragons. Crazy. You could just Yo. to be able to tracer. Dude, I never thought about it like that. Yeah, yeah it's basically is fusion destiny. And except you don't have bricks. Yeah. I mean, I guess Smasher is like the only quote unquote brick, but it actually Loki is like uh, Fusion Dust in your deck. Damn. Okay. okay what so you said, yeah. so you said that you can recognize if a card is bad or good right now. Uh, I mean, because of your experience. Let's talk about after the the Stay after longer. the ban list, after uh, you know, after the ban list for the next event without the new set coming. How do you see a card like Super Paul? I think. I mean. I really like Super Poly. Uh, I understand that you don't always want to draw going first, of course. Uh, you could do some cool things with playing around in and confusing a couple of times, and that's cool. But for the most part, like it's it's basically Dark Ruler that's better, I, I would say. Uh -huh. um, 
uh, there is no toad now. Like there is no toad anymore. And now I don't know that I think the toad is necessarily the reason that I want super poly because yeah, you can, you know, out a card that could otherwise negate your cards, but it still clears two monsters, puts tempo on the board. Um, and it, I think it's always going to be a very, very good card. Um, but I mean, it definitely has its downsides, mostly I think drawing it going first, but I think there's also like a handful of hands, uh, where it's just not enough. You know what I mean? Like you can yeah. play it, you hit two monsters, it looks really good. And then it's just not enough to clear the rest of their board. Um, and I don't know if that's, I don't know if I think it's common enough to justify not playing it. And I don't know if there is a card that could have done more when those hands come up. Yeah, I think I think what I'm trying to figure out right now is that when I think about the non-engine slots, right? Because I think I I would say most people's main decks in terms of core engine is relatively the same, right? And, and I think like if we think because you were mentioning how like deck building right now is kind of like the primary reason why someone would uh, win a tournament, not just top, right? Because I think topping can be quite like I think like you were saying that more easily happen. That can definitely happen easily easier. Uh, than winning, right? So, I think trying to figure out the non-engine slots is probably what's really important right now, and determining if Super Poly or another card in that slot could be better, especially when you don't have that many flex spots, in, in like um, in like combo decks, I would say. I still see or, that as like a ten percent advantage, though. Oh, okay. Do you mean like like when, yeah? W explain it, yeah. In the sense that, like you know, if. One going second card, it could be Super Kai, it could be Dark Ruler. Yep. You know, they, they're both serving the same role of, you know, I want to draw this when I go, when I go second for mm -hmm. the most part. Um, and even if one ends up being a little bit better than the other, I think it's probably just that, where it's not it's marginal, a huge right? difference. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and I think, I don't know that the, the non-engine cards for deck building is, like, where you gain the advantage. I think okay. it's more like the engine piece that you gain the advantage in. Okay, I think that's a. I think that's fair because the engine cards do more, right? Because the engine cards are like yeah. what facilitates your majority. They're of how you win the game. They're how yeah, right. Okay. Um, and the other cards are oh. like there to make it so that you can play. Mm, mm, okay, so I guess like right now is like determining. I guess for the people watching, is determining what engine they want to play. The like the non engines like matters obviously, but it's like way more marginal than people give it credit for, I guess. And going from there, okay. I was just gonna say, I think the more impactful thing would be the number of going second cards that you play and really getting that right, because you know what they do is fairly interchangeable for the most part. Um, but if you play too many, your hands are gonna fuck. If you don't play enough, you're just not gonna be able to play when you go second. And so I think finding that balance is probably more important than the, the specific individual card choices. Mm. Okay, and that's mm. what you're gonna say? I feel I feel what as as I was saying before, I feel but the non-engine right now is shaking a little bit. Like there are different takes right now. Someone wants to main deck again triple tactical talent because they think the meta is gonna shift more on an entrap state. Uh, someone who doesn't want to play Super Poly because they think Super Poly right now is not good enough. Because, okay, you go first, when you have Super Poly, you win. But that you can apply the same logic when you have Nibiru in hand and you go first and you complete your combo. Because who's going to beat you when you have full combo plus Nibiru? No one is going to beat you. So, in my opinion, then we have to analyze the non-engine card as cards that allow you to have the best chances going first and going second, in my opinion, against the top tier meta deck that in this moment are still sprite and tier element. Obviously, sprite is gonna be uh, obviously tier element is gonna be more than sprite right now because the access to Toad got limited. Even though you still have access to Toad, because you can still go into Toad by using the beckoning engine because it's a one card Toad that makes elf and Toad, but the recovery is different. So it's not the same thing as anymore. So at this point, then you have to analyze, is that good to have as an non-engine spot a card like Super Poly going second or a card like Nibiru going second? And I was thinking about that. I was like, what if I play Droplet and Imperfects in tier element? Uh, because my issue uh, is not Sprite. My, right now, my issue is the Mirror. Because if, if I have Super Poly, yeah, my dweller. opponent is Dweller me, I still lose. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, I think that's totally fair. Um... 
I think Valeria is the main concern in the mirror, and it, Super Poly doesn't help that much against Weller. I, I've won some games. Uh, like, for example, you super poly two things and then attack over with Mud Dragon, and then now you got rid of three monsters. If you could do sprite stuff main phase two, you're okay. Um, but that being said, I would rather just have a card that outs Dweller and prevents it from happening in that yeah. situation. Um, so, yeah, that's why I think Nibiru is definitely really bad. Uh, that's the reason I cut called by. I still think called by just because yeah, I don't it's like by style, it, I don't either because it's it's like you know the hand traps you already go to playing through them, so I don't yeah. think that is all that impactful. Uh, and then if you're playing it against here, it's it's okay. Like you're setting it as a trap defensively, and that's mm -hmm. probably what you're getting out of it. Um, and and then when you draw going second against here, it doesn't out well there. Uh, so I, I just don't feel like it it lines up very really well with what's going on. Um, and yeah, I think Dark Ruler is a little bit of the same thing because in the mirror it's just knocking out well or where something like Droplets would. Imperm, uh, it's probably good if you just hold it for Dweller as opposed yep. to like playing yeah. it and trying to stop him. I mean, they, they have to shock on it, but like 99% of the of people would, right? Because if they don't, they lose Dark Ruler. Oh. And some people could like either play either or. Like, you can't make a call, like, you have no idea. So. Um, yeah. yeah. Also, usually, dweller in a full board is not summoned under the elf. Like it's it's hard to summon a dweller. Like it's not like hard. You have to have a very specific game plan in order to summon the dweller under the elf. And not going for mascarena line if you play mascarena, or not going into an apollosa line if you have an apollosa. It's it's actually hard in my opinion. Or you mm -hmm. like you need an elf on top. Elf on top is not always the correct choice to go for. So that's if, why if, if you have Elf on top, you probably have, would have lost to a Nib too, right? Like it's so hard because I think right now that's why like like I'm curious to uh, hear your thoughts on hand traps. I guess it's specifically just Nib, right? That that you really consider. Like, do you do you have a game plan in mind to beat Nib? Is it mainly just like Apalooza or, or what? What do you think? Like, what should people do to like um, cross out? I don't even know. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think sprites as an engine is is pretty solid. Like maybe. Uh, more blues is a solid out to nib because yep. uh, then you can just search red before you keep going. Um, but I think in terms of hand traps as a whole, besides the like, you know, specific ones against decks like cherries or whatever, yep. um, but like the main deck hand traps, I don't know if I really think they're all that impact. Oh. Uh, sure. I think nib. I think nib is is a good card, but the other ones I just don't think I'll do enough or like stop them. Yeah. Okay. Um and yo, so I, I know we've been talking a lot about the, the meta and you and all that stuff, but I'm curious to hear from you personally. What do you um what would you consider like your favorite deck to play so far in Yu Gi Oh's history? You can name a couple if if you like, because I know it's hard. Yeah. Uh sure. Uh a couple of them. I really like dragon or like that. Obviously. <laughs> Extra deck monarch. Uh, was probably in the top three. Okay. I think that deck. Uh, I think that deck is probably a better goat format. Uh, okay. it's a. I think it's a really good meta. Um, technical play wise, uh, and I'm really enjoying like, you know, this last couple of months even. Too, hey. So maybe in one day. <laughs> uh, okay. No, that's interesting to hear you say that because like I I feel like. You know, more and more players and more and more people are getting back into Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, people who, like, have played, you know, um, for a long, extensive period. Like, just like yourself, right? Um, just for people who are listening in and want to relearn Yu-Gi-Oh. Or, or maybe learn Yu-Gi-Oh for the first time. Do you have, like, a piece of advice you can give people when they're attempting to relearn Yu-Gi-Oh, but also get, like, good at the game, right? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think getting good mostly comes from just playing a lot like if you if you play a lot i think if you look for if you don't get as caught up in, in technical play and focus more on deck building i think that's a i think that's a good advantage to to start with mm -hmm. if you're like getting like just trying to get good at the game um and yeah i mean you gotta you gotta build it up over time too because it's not it's not something that happens yeah. overnight like even just getting back into the game you know, I, I was looking dumb for a minute. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I was playing against these non Benedicts that have been Benedicts in the past and just still, and that's still a place I will get tripped up. Like if a deck that was played like while I wasn't playing and, you know, I play against it, uh, like Bro, I barely know it. I think when I, for example. when I heard, <laughs> when I heard of, um, when I heard you were playing again, I think you were playing at an RMC case tournament and you were playing like dragon link phantom knights or something like that <laughs> and i'm like i'm like yo yeah. is he not on the goo what the what is he doing <laughs> I was like, it's a dangerous dragon yeah. so good in that deck. <laughs> no, the danger is actually insane yeah. I, i'm not joking about it is insane. Yeah. Insane. bro i kept trying to think i'm like yo what, what are you it doing is. and i'm like oh shit he's making rusty with dylan Jurious. i'm like oh that's kind of nice okay okay yeah, yeah. and yeah, i've been playing almost a year again now and so like yep. Uh, I think one thing that helps is that new cards come out, and so it's like people aren't as much at an advantage when it's new cards, and we're all learning at about the same time. Yeah. Um, so I think that helps, and you know, you just play more games, so you just learn more of the things that you that you missed along the way. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely still like a lot of places where if a deck was meta while I wasn't playing and I play against it today, I I still have no idea what I can do. Mm-hmm. Bro, you think uh, you think you're gonna write another Yu-Gi-Oh book? Meta wise, <laughs> I don't know if enough has changed. Like, yeah. if I think enough changed at okay. some point, then maybe. But I, I just don't think the time has changed. Okay. And what what are you gonna say about I'm, the meta? Oh, um, <laughs> got it, got it. What's okay, up, guys? So, I was expecting when when you were talking about your favorite decks, I was expecting you mentioning Mermaid because I remember you playing Mermaid. Like you you invented, in my opinion, the Four axes, mermaid, and I was a huge fan of that deck. Uh, I, I don't know I if like you remember that. your list, but I still remember your list card by card. Like you were playing yeah, one infantry, one marksman. That deck came from a, a snowstorm. Uh, it's funny because like now I'm in DC, so it's like you know there's yeah. snow, nothing shut down, anything. But in Atlanta, it was like half an inch. The whole city shuts down. That like snowstorm. And we got trapped in my friend's basement for like the whole weekend and we came up with that day in the basement while we were trapped for the snowstorm of like three inches. Three, it, it was like three inches. Yeah. I loved it. Thank like Core Axis, in my opinion, really showed your technical um your technicality in deck build. Because in my opinion, that was pure perfection. Like if I have to talk about a deck that. that's made from bottom to top. Like thinking about every possible card in the main deck, I would definitely mention your top four in the Arch, Arc 2016 with the, with the yeah. four axes. And I was a huge fan of that. I played it for uh, a lot of time. And I was actually like learning better the game back in the days when we were playing that kind yeah. of deck. And, That's pretty sick. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that was a good deck. Yeah. No, because so it's so funny because um I recently have been like watching a lot of like retro Yu-Gi-Oh. Like I, I go on YouTube all the time and I just watch like old feature matches. I actually watched the one where you uh played against uh David Keener in the finals of that and you like eradicated yep. with big eye and I'm like, yo, that was crazy. Um so <laughs> I, I, I what what do you feel in terms of like do you prefer current Yu-Gi-Oh or do you or mo- or like retro, like what, what I mean, it's like, it's, does it just not matter? Is it just Yu-Gi-Oh on the end? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I th- would say I prefer current Yu-Gi-Oh just because I, from like a deck building perspective, I think powerful cards are like a good thing. Okay. Uh, you know, it's just more options. Right? Like that's basically what a powerful card is, is more options than the other card that have fewer options. Yep. Uh, and it, so I think there's like more opportunities for deck building when the cards are better. Um, and you know, the trend since the beginning of the game has been cards are getting incrementally better. Uh, so I think in general, I'm inclined to like, you know, whatever is next or upcoming more than whatever was previous. Okay. Yeah, dude, I, I, I find like, um, I had someone uh, hit me up recently. They were asking about, uh, cards like Ultimate Slayer. What, what are your thoughts? Do you think that card is, uh, going to be played soon or what? I don't know. It seems good, but it's, it's probably just, um, you know, if you look at the, if you look at it now, it doesn't hit Dweller. Uh, like it's it's a good card, but it's not. You know, they don't often just have one problem, and yeah. if the problem happens, it's a lingering effect. It just doesn't matter. So I I think it'll see play, but I don't know that I think it's like a super amazing card. Okay. Um. Okay. 
and we uh, were talking yeah. during the last last podcast with uh, Joshua Schmidt. I don't know if you saw the last podcast with Joshua Schmidt, and he wanted basically a different kind of interruption from traps. He does he doesn't want traps to be <clears> floodgate. He wants traps to be real interaction that you have to use smartly. Now, recently we got a new card. It's called the Daruma card. Like, did you read the new trap card? That... Yeah. Mm. What do you think yeah, about? Yeah, the new trap card is really good. It's it's interesting because if it came out a couple of weeks ago, I don't know, or like a couple of months ago with like the sprite and tier cards, I don't know if it would have been super played because the thing it it's weak to is if Omni negates are played. Because mm. that if Omni negates are played, you draw going second. It's not, it, it, you know, it, it's not what you want. I think right now there are like fewer Omni negates, so I think it'll probably start off fairly strong. Yeah. Uh, but it's a really well designed card, and I think it'll probably be a part of the game going forward. Yeah. Do you think trap decks can be better again? Because we're talking about traps right now, but like I feel like we haven't seen a really really good trap deck in a while, right? And I know they've been trying to do that with like labyrinth cards and whatever, but do you think trap decks could like ever be tier one, or do you think they're just too slow? I don't know because it's, there's not a lot of advantage in playing a trap deck over uh, just a regular deck outside of floodgates. Yeah, and so you have to have a reason to play a trap deck that's not just floodgates for mm. that to happen. I think. Yeah, um, which I haven't seen. Like a trap deck that's not just floodgates in, in a long time. Bro, last time I played an Elich pile, it was literally like 12 floodgates in the main deck. Like, <laughs> yeah, just all floods. Like, I was like <laughs> flooding them out and saying, uh, good luck, have fun, bro. GG. Yeah, I, it's right? tough, man. But I enjoy trap decks. I genuinely enjoy like the interactive trap decks. Like, I play like Trap BA or like Trap Shuttles. And it's, fun. Like, it's like old Yu Gi Oh! Yeah, it's like old Yu Gi Oh! It's like so much fun. Um, but I, I think you are right to a point where like right now, like the monsters just do so much. Like card design wise, monster cards do too much. And it's like kind of hard to justify playing trap cards sometimes. Unless like it's like a meta call where like everyone's on 15 hand traps or something. And then you play the trap deck. So it's like, you know, it's like a good matchup or whatever you call it. But yeah, it's tough. I mean, monsters were always designed to be better back in the day during the god format back in the day during like du during the, the formats before the 2007 monster were designed like the de de designed to be better i don't know if you ever read the theory of the pot of grid it was a very old article back in the days during the god format it's it it was basically dividing the format in three sections uh, it was purple, green, and yellow, in which if a deck with 40 yellow cards will always win the deck with 40 purple cards, 40, uh, uh, 40 green cards that are designed as a spell. Like, back in the day, this theory was very advanced for competitive play. But then we got an engine like Sky Striker, we got an engine like Eldritch, then the, the meta shifted because now a purple card becomes a yellow card or a green huh. card becomes a yellow card. So basically that's how the entire theory of the meta and, and the format shifted to the current meta state and why now spells are broken, why traps are broken, but monsters mm. were always designed to be the best ones. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's basically something that came in my mind right now because I remember all the articles back in the days but talking about the new sets Darkwing Blast did you read the new cards no, Dark... some surface level knowledge okay so if we talk about the general knowledge I think about the Shatrila the, the, the new cards like the Unicorn the Unicorn the the, the Fenrir uh, the, yeah the Beast the Fenrir the Unicorn the Beasted cards like uh, do you have any thoughts on those Cuts. Like yeah, on the upcoming set, any any ideas? You think it's gonna be a successful set from Konami's perspective, like sales and stuff like that? And do you think the cars overall are just like good, basically? Yeah, I think this is like a really good support set. Uh, I think the most recent set was probably the best set we've had in like years, and so this adds a lot of good cards to it. Uh, but it, you know, it's not like. There's not like a new tier or a new sprite kind of yep. theme, but it makes all the cards that we have better now. Um, so I think it'll be really good because, you know, we'll just like, you know, inch further along the power curve and give us better cards. Um, but probably we'll just be more of like a supporting set than, you know, what the previous set was. 
bro, it's gonna be so funny because you and I are coming right from uh, we're both coming from Ecuador and we're gonna be scrambling to find cars last minute. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Minap is gonna be wild. We're gonna be scrambling, but um, but uh, it's okay. Before we're we're getting towards the end, but I, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Uh, Yu Gi Oh, for you, you've traveled basically the world. What it's been your favorite place to go to as a result as a result of Yu-Gi-Oh. So you've been to this place due to Yu-Gi-Oh and so your your favorite if you have any. Yeah, I mean a, a bunch. It's really cool everywhere you get to go just because it's, you know, so different than wherever you are now. I remember Barcelona being really beautiful. Uh Brazil was really crazy. Um like the views in Brazil were probably better than the views we've ever seen yeah. like anywhere. Um Spain was like Spain was probably the most, or Barcelona was the city, but uh, it, it was probably the most beautiful city I've ever seen. I went there to play at YCS years ago. Um, but yeah, no, I've, I've I've gotten really lucky, been able to go a lot of places for it, and it's, it's been really cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, all right, guys, um, okay, this is uh this is uh Pat Patrick Hoban, man, the, the Road of the King, Return of the Kings. You would say it. he's back. Um, definitely look forward to seeing him at more and more events. Um, I'm, I'm personally excited too. I got into like, you know, know Pat and like met, met him at a bunch of events and it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, so, but, yeah, be- sure. but, uh, Pat, before we end the podcast, do you have any last parting advice, any last words of wisdom before we uh, end? Go to as many events as you can, because that's the, you know, way that you are going to win. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't you can't you can't you can't win if you don't enter so i think i think there are a lot of people that um you know go to some events and uh but i think you should make an active effort to go as many as, as you can i think they're really good i'll see you at all of them <laughs> and um okay. guys be- also one last thing in the comment section below well, next week we're gonna have um someone absolutely insane um on the podcast uh josh Bavarnik. he is judge world's yeah nationals he's um absolutely an insane resource as well as uh just just a very knowledgeable person on Yu-Gi-Oh rulings procedures let us know in the comment section below what questions you want us to ask him um and of course uh before before we end also uh check out our sponsors uh sleeve chiefs in the description box as well uh you can use pack five for for five percent off and yeah that's pretty much it guys uh the hoodies will be out soon uh for 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 us for sale uh, and then Pat will ship you one as well for you know being part of the the goo cast. But uh, appreciate all of you guys listening in. And if you guys enjoy, leave a thumbs up, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Thanks for having me, guys. Yep. Yeah. See ya. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome.